वेलकम टू आर नेशन स्टेट डायलॉग सीरीज राष्ट्र राज्य संवाद श्रृंखला में आपका स्वागत है आई एम डॉक्टर गीता कोचन मॉडरेटर फॉर टू डेज डिस्कशन Today it's our pleasure to have with us Professor Vivek Chand. Professor Vivek Chand is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and International Affairs at University of North Georgia. Uh, professor Chand has received his bachelor's degree from Lowa's uh, Wartburg College and master's degree from Florida International University. He received his doctorate in international relations uh, from Florida International University in 2018. and his broad research interest areas include foreign policy security studies and geopolitics and he's keen on the dynamics of security in south asia sino indian interactions in the asia pacific small states international politics and the emerging notions of indo pacific in strategic studies so today we have invited him to discuss his latest book that is uh, titled reframing the buffer state in international relations nepal's relations with india and china i think the very apt topic to talk uh, today when uh the nepalese prime minister prachanda ji is visiting india and we are going to have a reset in india nepal relations so welcome to our channel uh, professor vivek chanji uh let me just begin by you know um asking you or inviting you to actually elaborate a bit of the central argument of the book because that is what is very crucial for what we want to know about uh, nepal and its relations with india and china mm -hmm. and maybe talk about the overall idea of the book you know Thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Kocher. It's it's a pleasure to be here and uh, get an opportunity to talk about this topic. Uh, but the book that I have is actually a product of my dissertation, right? So I was writing this dissertation at Florida International University, and uh, the central sort of research puzzle that I wanted to focus on was uh, what role do small states play in contemporary international relations? Uh, we tend to focus on the foreign policy of bigger states big powers and in international politics um and i wanted to sort of put the spotlight on small states as well and there's an emerging uh, literature uh, on that particular topic uh, in international relations uh, in, in, the, in the last uh, decade or so and i just wanted to sort of elaborate on that right but i said you know what let's focus on a small state in south asia and then let's look at nepal in particular Uh, largely because of its geopolitical disposition right it's a small state uh, in between two powers that haven't really seen eye to eye for a while now uh, so i wanted to see how small states in particular like nepal um, interact with uh, these bigger powers in this uh, particularly uh, contentious uh, geopolitical space so my book largely focuses on looking at buffer states and tries to re sort of reframe it in contemporary international relations so it focuses on uh two particular aspects of uh, small state behavior so it focuses on um geopolitical space particularly as a buffer state uh, which uh, you know it's not necessarily just simply uh, a space where uh, it's seen as a discontinuation right so in in, in classical concepts of geopolitics a buffer state was sort of created by bigger states to uh have some space between contending powers right so if you had big states two big states uh, that uh were constantly clashing with each other these buffer states what they did was they sort of absorbed the uh, i would say competition between these two big states right so they were in in some ways consciously created to dissociate these two big powers and create space between them um but what i say is yes you know the origins are there uh of our of, of buffer states in that regard but in the contemporary sense buffer states are more than that um buffer states are dynamic political spaces where these contending powers uh, continuously uh, compete for interests right so i'm looking at india and china in this particular case within the context of nepal uh, but i also argue that buffer states are not just spectators they're not just uh, products of the dynamics between these big powers but they're also agents meaning that they also consciously play into this system right making decisions um sometimes uh, trying to navigate one against the other uh trying to make sure that its interests are also taken care of right so sort of bought into this buffer uh, system uh concept but at the same time they're also consciously making decisions right so i'm also focusing on the agency of these smaller states to sort of get a comprehensive understanding of okay big powers matter but then how are the smaller states also navigating these dynamics right so these two are the main points of of the book um and in particular 
yeah, I mean, I found the book is a little different from the off repeated, you know, the kind of a cl cliche that is happening between Nepal and its relations with India and China. So that way, I think there is a new academic perspective as well as a different dimension to looking at Nepal. Uh, but, you know, one of the interesting thing that I found in your book was you have compared Nepal's position as a buffer state to the conundrum of a swan. Okay, mm -hmm. which is threatened of its existence uh, to to the tiger that is India on one side, and uh, the wolf that is uh, China on the other side, right? In some sense, you are really comparing that as a you know uh, as a comparison of India and China in terms of span. So don't you think that in the changing geopolitical context, a small state, especially a state between two major powers, uh, mm -hmm. has become strategically significant and Nepal with all its leaders is more aware of its strategic importance. I mean, to me, it's like uh, a risen consciousness of the state to strategically maneuver for its advantages. So mm -hmm. uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, definitely. Right. And and uh, that's a very uh, accurate depiction of, of the sort of the conundrum that a buffer state finds itself in, right? Uh, a small state between much larger powers uh, constrained by geopolitical dispositions, right? It's it's something that uh, you just simply cannot control. You're located between big powers. You know that's the reality you have to live with, right? Um, and in the context of Nepal as well, right? And in, in as you aptly put, um, it does realize its sort of strategic importance, particularly in the context of uh, increased interests uh, in in the border regions of India and China, and uh, it's it's sort of played that quite well in that regard, right? Um, and this is something that is very interesting is the fact that uh, this, this strategic importance, this sort of self-conscious understanding, um, it's been there for a while, right? Particularly after uh, King Mahendra's rule uh, from the 50s mm -hmm. onwards, uh, you see that consistently throughout different regimes, right? Whether it be it, you know, the authoritarian monarchy, whether it be the constitutional monarchy or uh, the republic that it currently is in a, in a multi-party setting, uh, we see this understanding of like, okay, Nepal as a uh, sort of like a bridge, right? It's also tried to sort of play that with that particular role, right? Saying that Nepal is a bridge between India and China, and which is playing into this narrative that, hey, you know, it is strategically important um, in this particular disposition, in, in this particular context of geopolitics, largely because India and China have also been uh, increasingly sort of, I would say, putting a lot of emphasis on these border zones, right? So we also see a lot of uh, interesting work being sort of done in this particular area too. So um, I would say, yes, it, there's a high level of understanding of it. But uh, once again, uh, there's also like, 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 like as you're aware, uh, different party dynamics within Nepal, right? So who comes to power also kind of plays into it. But what we see is there's a particular consistent uh, concept of, of this understanding of, of, of the strategic importance of the country uh, in this particular area. Something like which you have actually talked in your book from, I mean, playing one against other to something like, you know, equi proximity, which came out uh, mm -hmm. during Oli's time, you know, right. I mean, from equidistance to equi proximity sort of narrative that you have played in your book. I mean, right. I, let, let's talk a little more about that in terms of your book, which you have looked at Nepal as a buffer state rather than what I call it as a small power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in that new geometrix of uh, international politics. So as a buffer, I mean, uh, Nepal probably is managing and cushioning the rivalry between the major powers. I mean, when I say buffer, it's like, you know, you're trying to manage or cushion the rivalry rather than playing an active role. Mm -hmm. uh, which in your context is relating to India and China, right? Mm -hmm. So however, in, in the change international context, Nepal's foreign policy also seems to be playing an active role in engaging with other powers in terms of equi proximity, as you're talking about in your book. So how do you contextualize these divergent positions of Nepal as an agency? Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, in reality, I, I think they kind of complement each other, right? Um, this idea of, okay, you know, you are a small state between these two big powers. Uh, but there's also, once again, right, going back to one of the central arguments of my book is uh, these states have agency and they will use that agency to pursue its interests, right? And uh, 
yes, there's a lot of constraints on what Nepal can and cannot do, particularly given that there are restraints because of where it's located, right? It's landlocked between two major powers. Um, but this notion of also sort of incorporating other extra regional powers, right? As, as you're aware, and Nepal joining the Millennium Corporation Challenge uh, led by the US, right? So some have argued it's just that it's an effort to uh, internationalize its um, its uh, standing and also it's, uh, I would say, you know, sort of moving away from putting all eggs in one basket, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you increasingly see this with uh, the analysis on small states is that they will try to use these extra regional interconnections to sort of hedge its bets, if you may, uh, increase its, um, I would say, uh, capability to make decisions and 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 move for, forward with just not being constrained with the choices it has uh, with regard to its neighbors, right? So this idea of internationalizing, perhaps, is just that, right? In buffer states, yes, it is a small state between contending powers, uh, but most buffer states are still small states, right? Uh, if you look at many of the examples, if you may, uh, you will find that historically uh, these buffer states have been small powers, right? Um, you know, look at examples like Mongolia, for example. Yes, you know, physically it's it's a much bigger state, uh, but compared to China and Russia, you know, demographically, economically, uh, still considered a small state in that regard, right? So uh, there's also this aspect of uh, comparison or comparative power, if you may, uh, which also defines small states. And 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 if you look at it, most of the buffer states. Uh, do fall into the category of small states, right? And that also means that they they might use techniques that um, seek to sort of increase their uh, space for agency. Um, and, and and from my perspective, I see this effort to bring in the U.S. particularly uh, as an effort to do just that, right? And it's a very interesting conversation to have. Um, and then definitely something I would like to uh, look at in the future as well, right? Well, but I think when you're talking about the MCC, um, I mean, I'm I'm looking at the internal political dynamics that's happening within Nepal. Uh, so I see that, you know, when the Congress party was in power, I mean, Doba was the prime minister, probably MCC got major support. Mm -hmm. uh, but when, when NCP, the National Communist Party, which was there in Uli's time, or the United Front, I would call it as, was there, MCC was not passed. And in fact, now when... Prachanda, again, you know, the Maoist, pro-Maoist is there. Uh, probably that dynamics is going to be reshaped in a different direction. We really have to see how that, you know, uh, plays out. Uh, yeah. Because we have a history of Prachanda being more inclined towards China. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, let, let's look at the, you know, the thing which you have really uh, focused in your book. And I found it very interesting. And I would want uh, our viewers to listen to that and mm -hmm. maybe get more comments of yours on on. China-Nepal relations in particular. Uh, I mean, in the book, you mentioned, and I quote that, the early years of Nepal's unified history were characterized by the Qing connection of Nepal as an entity that needed to be checked in order to safeguard its frontier regions, that is Tibet. And you go on to add that in 1910, the Qing Amban in Tibet wrote, and I again quote that, we China, Tibet and Gorkhas are like members of the same family. In If any one of them is injured any way, the others too become affected, okay? So does that imply that with the notion of a tributary system, the Qing Empire perceived Nepal as the territory to be placed under its control and sphere of influence? I mean, are you looking at that? And mm -hmm. of course, you further mentioned that uh, Sun Yat-sen, you know, the father of Chinese nation, considered Nepal to be one of the lost territories, okay? Mm -hmm. So do you see this historical resonance is in post-liberation with Mao Zedong's reiteration of five fingers of the Tibetan palms policy, which has again become very significant now? And how have all of these notions evolved to present times under President Xi Jinping's leadership in your understanding? Because this will also give us uh, some insights to what is China-Nepal relation today and what it might happen, you know, tomorrow, something like that. Yeah. Right. I think it's a very interesting question, right? This idea of, okay, you know, um, this idea of like historical uh, conceptualizations of space, particularly in the neighborhood, right? And um, if, you, if you look at the historical ties between Nepal and China, 
to some extent, yes, in, in certain aspects, uh, uh, certain instances, pardon me, of history, um, there was this notion of Nepal being one of the tributaries, right? And particularly right. Uh, in the mid 1800s and words, um, even going a little bit further earlier, um, Nepal did send a few, a few, uh, I would say, missions of tributes to uh, the Qing Emperor, right? But uh, another big factor is, you know, changing political dynamics, and, and the Qing were in the decline, as 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 we know, and they ceased to exist in the nine in 1911, right? And uh, what we do see with that re with that particular relation is is, is this historical tie between um, the Kingdom of Nepal and uh, the Qing Emperor. Um, I mean, yes, in, in, in the context of the Qing, um, Nepal was added as a later uh, tribute uh, in, in, in the tributary system, if you mean, right? It's, it's, a, it's a tributary uh, that needed to sort of um, bow down to, you know, the, the celestial uh, you know, emperor, right? Uh, but, but what we do see is from the Nepalese perspective, um, and, and there's very little work on this actually, uh, unfortunately, uh, but from the Nepalese perspective, is it's just that Nepal still is autonomous. It's still independent. Um, and it's just a symbolic sort of gesture to the Qing uh, to maintain the peace, right? Uh, because the Nepalese do uh, invade Tibet twice, right? Uh, under the Gorkhas, um, you know, to, to um, you know, under different pretenses of economic issues. Um, but what we do see is that uh, there's some implicit understanding that um, the the Qing were in the decline and that they were having a hard time sort of, um, I would say, projecting their power even into uh, the frontier provinces such as uh, Tibet, right, which is, you know, time and again, had a very interesting relationship with the Qing. Um, what does that tell us about the post, uh, you know, I would say establishment of the PRC uh, in, 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 in the context of, of uh, the relations between Nepal and China? Um, I do think that uh, from the Chinese perspective, uh, there was an effort to sort of stabilize relations largely because there was an understanding that uh, Tibet was seen as a restive frontier, largely because of, as we see time and again, there is uprising against Chinese rule. Um, and then there's this implicit understanding that stabilizing these frontiers is very important uh, for the stability of the People's Republic of China, right? And I I do think that's one of the motivations why um, you know the approach towards China has been uh, towards Nepal from China has been largely to stabilize relations, right? Um, recognize Nepal as an independent state, um, while at the same time ensuring that uh, there's high level bilateral ties, um, and we see this increasingly important after two thousand eight. And as 2008 rolled around, Beijing was hosting the Summer Olympics. Uh, so it was sort of like a heralding of uh, China as a significant power in international politics, right? But then we also see um, protests in Tibet the same year, a few months before um, the, the Summer Olympics takes place, right? And from then on, we see increased interest, particularly you see a lot of investment um, in, in security institutions, right? So after that, you see increased investment in riot police particularly, uh, largely because um, there was an effort to sort of put a lid on the protests by Tibetan refugees, right? Um, uh, in, in, in areas where, you know, the Chinese embassy was located particularly, right? There's also efforts to curtail uh, the rights of Tibetan refugees uh, to practice uh, religious festivals like the birthday of the Dalai Lama, right? So what we see is increasingly um, this effort to sort of put a lid on um, the aspirations of the Tibetan people, particularly, right? I mean, within Tibet, there's, you know, of course, China has authority to do just that, but outside of it, uh, particularly in a smaller state like Nepal, um, which uh, to a large extent allow Tibetan groups to express their feelings, uh, their political aspirations before suddenly after 2008, we see an increased, uh, uh, I would say, control of these activities, right? And even today, there's a lot of reluctance from the Nepalese government to allow that. So uh, in the contemporary sense, um, I would still say, you know, this this idea of Tibet as, a, as an important frontier is still there from the Chinese perspective. Uh, but engaging economically has been the other way in which to also ensure that, right? And uh, if you look at the BRI projects, all of that, um, one of the motivations as it's, it's sort of like uh, discussed is, you know, the development of its frontier regions to 
bring economic prosperity to these regions by connecting them with economies across the border, right? And Nepal seems to be right there uh, next to Tibet as a viable option to do just that, right? And we see that um, in 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 um, investments in well, particularly if you look at Himalayan Airlines, right? It's it's a joint venture um, with uh, Tibet Airlines. So uh, you see some of these aspects happening here, but uh, it's taken a largely economic infrastructure a dimension, but the political interests are still there. No, but uh, what I want to really push you a little further on this issue is in terms of, uh, you know, the narrative that I often hear from the Nepalese mm -hmm. is a few factor of, uh, you know, Sikkimization of Nepal in the sense when they look at India, they're always talking about, you know, Nepal becoming a territory like Sikkim. It will be controlled by India. And especially now that, you know, the citizenship law has been passed, these narratives have again come to the fore. Right. But uh, looking at China's history and understanding how, how China looks back at its history and talking about reclaiming its territory, whether it has been uh, in talk of uh, Hong Kong or Macau, and now even Tibet, right? Or mm -hmm. not, no, sorry, now even Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if if the notion that you pointed out in your book about Sun Yat-sen's statement about lost territory mm -hmm. uh, is re-emphasized, and of course, Mao was really re-looking at Nepal as the one of the fingers of Tibet, right? The five fingers uh, mm -hmm. sort of policy. Then do you think that, you know, China is really going to reclaim that lost territory in some ways? Mm -hmm. And if so, or if not, I mean, it all it all depends. How are the Nepalese reacting to it? Why there is not a strong narrative within Nepal in terms of that fear factor when, when they talk about Sikkim as the, you know, as mm -hmm. the uh, really stay. I mean, stabilizing Nepal as one aspect of it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I understand because it's a neighboring state, you really want to have stable neighbors. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the tensions in any neighborhood, whether it's Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal would, you know, influence China. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about this, you know, aspect of it? So I'm just really pushing you further on the question that you I just mentioned. Yeah, mm -hmm. of course. Um, I personally do not uh, see that whole idea of, you know, like uh, reclaiming Nepal uh, as a lost territory, particularly because uh, much of it will be based on the notion of, once again, right, the tributary system. Um, but that system also included um, countries like Myanmar, for example, or the Kingdom of Siam, or which is present in Thailand, right? It also included uh, large parts of Korea, right? So, um, in the modern context, I don't particularly see this notion, particularly from the Chinese side, uh, where Nepal is seen as a lost territory. Right? I'm referring to Sun Yat-sen, largely going back to the nationalist period in China. Um, but going back to your point on Sikkimization, I, I do think there's a lot of political currency, particularly in Nepal, uh, to use this rhetoric, right? Like, oh, India is land grabbing. Oh, India is using its power to make changes within and Nepal's domestic political uh, context, right? So that definitely has a lot of political currency amongst uh, the Nepali public. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's, um, I would say, uh, much more externalized in the form of political rhetoric during elections, particularly um, in, in Nepal's multi-party, you know, very, very dynamic multi-party um, parliamentary system. Uh, but we don't see that happening with China yet. Um, there are some groups with Nepal which might use that particular rhetoric, but uh, this traditional rhetoric of, oh, Sikkimization, right? I mean, I, I do think uh, that's been extensively used as a means of just that, right? Like garnering political currency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's a very uh, sort of, um, I would say, diverse society with many different uh, ethnic and religious and uh, I would say uh, tribal lines, right? So how do you move across these lines? And that, that particular concept has become sort of the way in which to garner support, right? And I think that's it's just that, right? I think the whole idea of China uh, doing the same, like you know, threatening Nepal's existence, it still hasn't caught up in particular. Um, and it's, I think it's just that, it's a matter of um, in, in, in international relations, what we call securitization, right? Like secure, you know, securing, or casting particular uh, a particular idea as a threat uh, to your national identity, right? It 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 uh, it's 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 been bought by the Nepali public for a while now, and then that definitely uh, has been entrenched, right? Which while the rhetoric you know, regarding China has not been uh, widely accepted yet. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I do think there's just that there's domestic dynamics at play as well. Um, and then how do we cast particular actors uh, in the political sense? It, it does matter. And then that I, I haven't seen that with China yet. Um, but that might happen in the future. We don't know yet. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm just uh, taking a little beyond what you've written in your book in terms of what is happening in in the present time, and especially when uh, Prime Minister Prachanda is visiting India. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, how India-Nepal relations are going to be reshaped, especially the economic and other ties. Maybe security as an aspect has become very significant for the Nepalese because they are really looking back at the issues of identity, looking at the issues of territory and things like that, right? That right. have become in the forefront. Right. Uh, but having looked at what Prachanda had done in the past as the as the when the first time he became the prime minister and looking at how you know the the former prime minister uh, Oli did when uh, when there was a united you know communist front mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the the this dynamics of uh, nepal being the buffer state conscious of its geopolitical context mm -hmm. trying to internationalize its position in in the context of uh, geography you know uh, linking it to us and everything is really play out uh, in the new dynamics that is coming up, uh, whether it is India-Nepal relations or whether it is uh, Nepal-US relations, vis-a-vis -vis, you know, Nepal-China relations sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of changes within Nepal's political space as well, right? Uh, you know, the current uh, political stash establishment has been marred with uh, controversies. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're aware with the the refugee, uh, you know, fake refugee yeah. identity cards, right? And it's it's definitely um, taken a toll. And you also see within Nepal, there's an increasing um, rise of independent or, you know, you know, I would say independent candidates particularly, right? You look at uh, the mayor of Kathmandu, for example, uh, who is an independent candidate, young, dynamic, right? Uh, an artist. So there is some level of the domestic political changes within uh, Nepal's uh, political landscape as well, I think, right? Particularly amongst the uh, the youth of the country. Um, but, but there's also, like you said, changing dynamics, particularly from the context of the U.S.'s role. And the U.S. has increasingly also shown interest in uh, engaging in this particular space. Um, and, and that's it's really fascinating to see, right? I mean, and the U.S. has its own interests, obviously, uh, with regard to China, um, but also there's an increasing, in, in, as we know, U.S.-India um, relations as well, right, particularly through the Quad um, or through the Malabar exercises, uh, the, the naval front. Um, and increasingly, we see uh, congruence of interest between the two parties, right, and, and that definitely also adds to, um, you know, I would say Nepal's own options with regard to engaging with extra regional powers, right? Um, and and in, interestingly, if you look at um, its, its position on um, what's going on in Ukraine, um, you know, I'm just bringing that up here. I think it's very interesting mm -hmm. to look at its positionalities in this particular context. Um, it's repeatedly voted in favor of condemning Russia, right? Um, you know, and I think it all goes back to tying it to a buffer state, a small state, uh, very conscious of its limitations, uh, but also uh, conscious of uh, the precarious nature of its sovereignty, right? And then it all goes back to that, I think, at the end of the day. Uh, but with Prachanda coming in, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what positions he takes, because once again, this, this meeting is significant um, with, with Prime Minister Modi once again. Um, largely because it's seen as resetting ties uh, with with India, um, which has, you know, as, as we know, it's been a little bit rocky in the in the last few years. Um, but what we'll have to see, um, uh, you know, I would say in, in regard to what role uh, the U.S. plays, I think that's going to be very interesting uh, to look at in the in the near future. Um, but yeah. I mean, my whole perceptions or my you know standpoint always has been saying. Uh, advocating that you know Nepal is not about a competition between India and China, rather it would turn out to be a proxy state between U.S. and China. That would be very dangerous for Nepal to you know maneuver because there would be the imbalance it would be created. I mean, it'll have to make choices which are very very hard choices to be made. I mean, mm -hmm. for India and China because both are neighbors, it has always trying to balance this relationship, and 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 at 
And in one sense, India and China, even if a little bit of competitive relationship, it has not been very, uh, you know, animosity in that sense after 62. You know, mm -hmm. there has been a little dilution of, you know, uh, animosity. It's not an enemy state sort of thing, relation. Uh, though, you know, recently we again have some kind of disturbances between India and China, but anyway, it will not go for a war. It's not going to be, uh, you know, literally, uh, you know, hijacking each other spaces and things like that. So there would be a overall understanding. But with US and China, probably Nepal will find it very difficult to play. And especially when, you know, Nepal joined MCC, uh, China was really unhappy, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of uh, position or space Nepal has given to US. Right. And increasingly, that would be the tussle. So that was my perception. Uh, but moving a little towards, again, India, I mean, and pulling you to a context which is there in your book in some sense, but not exactly in your sense, is mm -hmm. one of the very interesting issue about Hindu state, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you see this whole contradiction in Nepal over the issue of Nepal being a Hindu state? I mean, uh, because many have talked Nepal never declared itself as a Hindu state and then where was it written in the constitution maybe Prithviraj uh, Shah declared that but but it was not accepted and things like that you know there's a whole kind of controversy in uh, in Nepal and then do you see the affinity and civilizational linkages that India has always been emphasizing will mm -hmm. impact the future changes in Nepal and its relations with India because many of times when I wrote in Nepal about Nepal being a Hindu state, and people started, you know, telling me, uh, I mean, you really don't know how the Nepali society is evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, the youngsters are pro-communist, approach, you know, Chinese rather than Indian. Uh, so they don't even be believe in religion per se. And I always felt that in one sense, Nepal is still an orthodox society. I mean, I do see it as a very Hindu-oriented society compared to whatever the influence of Chinese-ness or commercial you know the modernity of capitalism has brought into nepal mm -hmm. and besides that i mean how do you see this trilateral relationship of nepal with india and china evolving in future the last question to it yeah right uh going back to your question about uh being a hindu majority state i mean that you know that people to people connection uh between india and nepal i don't think uh there is a stronger bond between two countries um as a strong as, the, as these two right we have an open border a um, lot of interactions between people at the you know the at the ground level, uh, going back all the way to the political elites, right? So all sectors of societies have interacted uh, across all ethnic all caste lines, um, whether we with Uttarakhand or with um, Sikkim and Darjeeling or with UP and Bihar, you know, all uh, these these uh, states of India that share borders with Nepal have had historical links. Uh, through different communities, of course. Um, but in regard to political perceptions, right? Once again, going back to this idea of uh, political rhetoric, I think this idea of, um, you know, India as, oh, you know, like it's it's here to take over this idea of Sikkimization. I think it, like I said, it still sells uh, even, even amongst the youth, right? And, and, and that's one of the reasons why this securitization of, of India has, particularly being very successful, I think it's it's kind of generate traverses generations as well. Um, but um I I you know it's it's correct to say like we're you know I think Nepal is still very rooted in its cultural traditions, whether it be it Hindu or Buddhist, right? Those two religions have uh, played a very dominant role uh in the society, you know, throughout Nepal's cultures and then people groups. Um, but in regard to support for the for a Hindu state, it is very fascinating, right? Over eighty percent of the people are Hindu, but um, the country is still considered to be secular, right? Uh, you know, and then uh, there isn't much, I would say, uh, on the ground uh, support to revert back to a Hindu kingdom, right? Although officially it was under the monarchy, um, but but in in the political space, I think people have a very uh, hands off approach towards that particular concept right um and uh there's a lot of work on how to describe that right it's it's a very fascinating dynamic right in the majority country but uh going back to a hindu state once again um i see that fear that you know like of of uh, perhaps um a sort of uh, you know affecting intercommunal tensions as well because nepal is a very diverse society with a significant buddhist population and i think there's a strong ethos to uh, sort of gives space to all groups, right? It's a, you know, I, I call it a 
a country of minority groups, right? The biggest group is about 16% of the country. Um, so how do we ensure peace between the different groups? I think there's one of the big factors also um, within society uh, to maintain the peace, right? That's what there was not a lot of support for uh, ethnic provinces, for example, right? Uh, when mm -hmm. Nepal was uh, transforming from a unitary state uh, to a federal a un a federal system, uh, there is very little support from the ground uh, level to actually have ethnic groups, uh, ethnicity-based um, provinces, mm -hmm. right? Mostly, yeah. uh, largely speaking, right? Um, largely because, you know, the society is so, in, you know, it's, it's, it's composed of all these groups in existing in many different parts of the country, and they've intermingled over the years uh, to such an extent that any any given piece of land, any given piece of Nepal, you, you'll see uh, this diversity being reflected. Of course, some groups might be more dominant than the others, uh, but I do not see, um, you know, particularly from the Chinese side, uh, having the same level of uh, influence on the public at the ground level, largely because there's so much affinity in language and culture and religion, you know, and then people watch Bollywood movies, people watch Hindi serials, Sasbaho serials, as we call them, right? Uh, they've been <laughs> there for for a while, right? for a long time, right? I grew up watching these movies. And, you know, one of the reasons why many of us also pick up Hindi is because of this cultural um, footprint from India, right? Because of how similar we are in terms of cultures. And I don't think um, from a particularly people-to-people -people point of view, um, India will be replaced by China. I don't think that's happening. Um, I do see that China has a lot more political agency, largely because it's also emphasized a lot of um, infrastructure projects. And it's, this is very interesting to write, like focusing on things that people can actually uh, see, right? Tangible results, particularly, right? Whether it be it a big airport, whether it be it a highway. Uh, if you compare India and China, you know, investments from India are much higher. Uh, be it in you know capacity building or industries, um, but I think uh, what China has done in the last decade or more is just that emphasizing these um, tangible results, right, which people can see, uh, rather than long term investments like the EU or India does in human capacity building, which is a lot more uh, focused on long term growth of society and human development, right, which are not always seen. Uh, with the same glitz and glamour that you can, uh, you know, sort of inaugurate uh, an airport with, right? It's not the same. So I, I do think that uh, we have to factor that in as well, which is also, once again, a very fascinating approach of, of economic state from China. Um, but uh, going back to your point of view, I think culture is still a very significant tool um, that uh, India has been sort of, I would say, using with regard to uh, you know its relations in Nepal right and if you if you look at any sort of official statements so you know by uh, Prime Minister Modi as well this is always this this emphasis mm -hmm. on civilizational links right through religion through history and I think that still is a very significant uh part of it right? it's very interesting to see how these dynamics work right at the political level you see it's certain rhetoric but on the ground, the reality is pretty different, right? And economically speaking, uh, I think Nepal is still heavily reliant on India. So there's also that factor that needs to be considered, right? No, I, I mean, I, I agree in the sense, um, you know, that in terms of the tangible benefits, Nepal mm -hmm. do see China as, you know, one of the country which has economically grown, the success factor of its economy and the, the you know material life in China is really really fascinating for the Nepalese. But in terms of the human development, the societal development, in terms of how you know the ethnic groups can mit mitigate its relations inter you know ethnic relations, uh, democracy really plays an important role. I I don't think Nepal would be able to you know copy the China model and mm -hmm. be what China is today, uh, un unless until it really wants to have. A greater turmoil within Nepal, you know, right. sort of thing. But uh, but but one factor which I am looking in India is at the societal level, at the youth level, youngsters are getting more fascinated or more nationalist in their orientation. And if that happens in Nepal, I mean, how do you see that would really impact? Would that be, I mean, the national sentiments, would that be something like a mixture of a communist material influence? Mm -hmm. Was was there Hindu, you know, sentiments, or would be there another 
you know, clash between uh, youngsters about finding their own identity space within the whole complex heterogeneous society that is Nepal. I mean, that is one factor would be very interesting to look at. Yeah. Right. But I, I, I don't necessarily think that most of the people, the youth in Nepal are particularly pro-communist, right? I think there's a lot of emphasis on uh, economic development, largely because, as you know, uh, Nepal's youth have, you know, gone abroad. Um, yeah. Brain drain is a big issue. Uh, you go to many villages and it's empty. You know, young people are nowhere to be seen, right? And you see a dip in, in the birth rate as well. You know, Nepal's population is going to start shrinking uh, in the next few decades. Um, I, do, I do think that these are, you know, issues of development, right? And if you look at Nepal's per capita income, I mean, it's... Um, the growth is pretty abysmal. It's 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 nothing to be like you know talking raves about, right? Much of it is driven by uh, remittances. Uh, there is growth in tourism, which is one of the sectors which has uh, greatly impacted economic development. Um, but I do see that particularly in the urban youth, there's a lot of disillusionment uh, with uh, long-term economic prospects. And once again, you know this this leads to resentment and. Um, there is a lot of resentment, I think, towards uh, the Nepali governments in the last, you know, however many decades uh, the, the, the current system has been in place. Uh, but uh, this idea of, uh, once again, um, you know, your identity, right? I, I do think that uh, Nepal's, uh, you know, societies, I would say societies because there's many different ethnic groups, they are going, uh, I would say, changes with regard to uh, what their place is in modern societies, right? I mean, people have access to all the information they need on the, in the, in the you know, palm of their hands to their phones and people want better lives. And I think that that definitely plays a big factor. But uh, at the same time, politically, you see, you know, like this, uh, I would say rhetoric towards India has always, like I said, it's, it's been there. And in the youth too, it still, I think, resides quite uh, significantly. Um but I, you know, I, I at the same time, you look at what they're consuming and, and most of the people in Nepal are consuming Indian cultural products like Bollywood, mm -hmm. uh, music from Bollywood, from Bollywood or cereals from India, right? And then I don't think they, they're going to go away. Um, but, you know, it's just this dichotomy. Politically, they will say, oh, we don't like the Indian government's policies. But then if you look at the cultural side, um, there's still a significant influence from from India, right? And of course, there's influence from uh, the West as well, right? So it's a very interesting yeah. amalgamation of all that. Um, How is that going to impact politics in the long run? I mean, it's only time will tell. And uh, there, you know, there's once again the rise of independent, you know, I would say candidates in the political landscape, and and that could be just that, right? And how how far are we going to take that? Is going to be a big factor. Um, and then that could be something that could also redefine Nepal's foreign policy, but I think it's going to take a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do agree in the sense where the, in terms of what uh, the political rhetoric is and what the cultural or religious bondage of the society is, mm -hmm. there is totally a dichotomy. There's a paradox of evolution of Nepal in one sense. Uh, but having said that, I, I also see that, you know, from uh, you know Devaji as the last prime minister to Prachanda coming to India, visiting in some religious places as well, probably that notion is going to be re you know emphasized about how Hindu nationalism or you know the relations between India and Nepal in terms of cultural civilizational ties is going to be you know re-emphasized and reset in certain proportions. Right. Uh, that would really reshape uh, India-Nepal relations and how. How China and the US plays in Nepal would be one story, which I'm sure your next book would be on that. You know? <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> uh, in the long anyways. future. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, anyway, thank you very much. And it was a great pleasure. We can continue on and on with this discussion. But this is a very short interaction for our viewers so that they can get a crisp of what your book is and know what is happening in Nepal in a very short duration. Uh, so... You know, thank you very much for joining this uh, interaction and we'll continue. And to our viewers, uh, please hit the like, uh, like icon and subscribe to our channel for many more interesting uh, discussions uh, on various international relation issues. Namaste.